Thank you so much, Tristan. And thanks everyone for, for having me. I really appreciate the invitation. Um, and as I was saying uh, before, when some people were online, but not everyone, um, I know you guys have been talking about this stuff and having it at the center of your uh, attention for a while as part of this group. So feel free to uh, ask questions as we go or even to um, you know challenge something I'm saying or provoke something as well, that's fine. I feel really comfortable with that. So, um, and I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Um, I'll begin by acknowledging that I am meeting from uh, Wadamadigal land, from Aboriginal land in um, Sydney, uh, land that has never been seen. So, uh, and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, and what I wanted to do today, and I don't, I decided that I wouldn't do a PowerPoint presentation, partly because I wanted to invite more of a conversational style and I found on, on Zoom that's quite difficult to do if you are sharing screen with a PowerPoint. Um, but also because I wanted to tell a bit of a story, uh, which it comes from hopefully to the intersection of two lines, which I think is gonna work. And one was when uh, Tristan asked me to do this, me reflecting back, I, I did quite a lot of work on social capital. Um, so I did my PhD on social capital, or particularly the concept of social capital and, and what it meant in economics, what it meant in the broader social sciences and the politics of how it was contested, um, particularly in Australia, which is you know where I'm studying. Um, and I, I was wanting to reflect on uh, what that meant now. Um, and I think of what I was being asked to do uh, and is hopefully interesting to you guys, um, connecting it to some work I'm doing now, is uh, thinking about some of the parallels, which uh, I'm gonna argue uh, reflect a common origin and a common intellectual and political um, dynamic between debates which are around social investment and social capital. That's not that surprising. The terms are pretty uh, similar. Um, and which reflect uh, a, a both, I'm going to say, an intellectual project, which is around, on the one hand, uh, something I think Ben Fine accused social capital of doing quite some time ago of economic imperialism. Um, and on the other hand, intellectually, of trying to make sense of the value of the social in an economised and rationalised form that would be able to intervene in particular kinds of policy processes. Um, and then politically, I think it reflected not just the intellectual expansion of economic methods, but the practical economization of the social. That is, the, the, the social was being transformed and policymakers were using economic tools in the kind of Foucauldian sense um, of uh, applying economic rationalities to the world to remake it uh, in that light. And, in that sense, I'm going to suggest that that has created a, a practical challenge for policymakers, um, which was solved by the, the concept of social capital, or potentially solved, um, and also created a, a challenge. So it created a challenge for policymakers who um, were advancing a particular kind of political agenda, um, which created problems on the ground, in particularly of political resistance. Um, but also in some ways of growing poverty and inequality. Uh, and on the other side, it created a potential, the, the same concept created a potential political opportunity. Um, and so that has transformed, I'm going to suggest, one of the, the ways politics happens. Um, it hasn't replaced politics, I'm going to suggest, with, but, but rather transformed where and how it happens. And that those dynamics are common to these two concepts. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how that works. So hopefully that's of interest to you guys. Hopefully I'm on the right track. Uh, and as I say, you know, feel free to, to engage and, and ask questions as we go along. So I'm going to start with uh, the emergence of the, that concept of social capital. And um, to, to briefly recap uh, Ben Fine, um, we might say that one account of what social capital is was an attempt uh, within rational choice theory and uh, mainstream economics to expand the analysis from the object that we normally think of as the, of the economy to basically everything. So this is through uh, the period where Gary Becker is applying concepts of rational choice theory to the organization of the family, to explaining gender pay gaps, to explaining racism, to explaining suicide, 
so, you know, the entire social world is becoming explicable through rational choice theory and implicitly through a kind of price dynamic um, where we understand how people engage as rational actors uh, making constrained optimality choices where they trade things off. And at least implicitly, if not explicitly, um, that there are a series of implicit prices between virtually any choice that someone could make about anything uh, in the world. Um, and so that, that's an intellectual project that, that, that is clearly happening. So it's obvious that Gary Becker is doing that. The Chicago School is um, developing that kind of economics. We've got public choice theory, uh, re-understanding and reimagining the state along much the same lines as a series of individual actors trying to maximize things uh, through the decisions they make as bureaucrats within the state and as ministers and MPs. Um, so that is a practical uh, process that's going on. Uh, it is potentially also, you know, in a, in a, as I say, the Foucauldian sense, if you go to the kind of lectures on biopolitics, which talk almost exactly about this type of thing happening, you know, citing Becker and so forth, and that expansion of the Chicago project. Also uh, a reworking of the way that governments govern. Um, so those two things are happening in, partly in parallel. And we would now, in retrospect, many social scientists would call that process neoliberalism you know, in some way, shape or form. Those two things happening, a kind of remaking of the intellectual understanding of the social alongside a remaking of policy paradigms um, to emphasize competition, uh, property rights and uh, governing via markets. So for Ben Fine, and I, I think I tend to agree, if you look at um, Coleman and the, the, that rational choice tradition that comes to uh, develop social capital as a concept, social capital is the solution to a problem. And it's an old problem in rational choice theory, uh, the, the one as to why is there order in the first place? So why is it that people don't just kill each other to get things done? Um, if, you know, why do they bother trading? at all, uh, how, what is this kind of um, social glue that means that people do follow the rules, they do cooperate? And that that solution um, potentially explains the governance of common pool resources, the kind of Garrett Harding problem. And please, if, if I'm saying, I'm not quite sure where to pitch because I don't know all of you guys, so I'm presuming you, you kind of are familiar with the, the people I'm tossing out there. But if you're not, can you just put up your hand or interrupt me and say, what, who on earth is that person you're talking about? What, what is this concept? Um, but I'll keep going otherwise. Uh, which is uh, so, so that problem of governance. Um, and social capital comes to represent in the work of Eleanor Ostrom and others, an alternative solution to private property rights as a way of governing common pool resources, but also as a, a kind of higher order solution to the governance problem itself. That is, how do we govern? And one of the strains of literature that comes out of it is one that's associated with a turn in international uh, institutions to focusing on governance as, a, um, as one of the problems of development in the global south that's gone wrong, that needs to be, um, to, to be addressed. And that social capital is potentially a kind of collective resource that allows that to happen. It's something that facilitates trust, potentially is trust, um, but it is um, something that allows people to cooperate in circumstances where if we were running this only in the short term and operating only out of uh, individual self-interest, people wouldn't necessarily cooperate. And the, that resource that allows people to do that um, greatly enhances economic outcomes at the collective level, but also individually. And this is a bit distinct from another approach which comes out of Bourdieu and I think it's taken up more in sociology and um, Nan Lin and other people talking about it in migration studies where it's more of a, a resource of networks that individuals access in order to be able to um, kind of translate economic resources from their social networks into economic resources. But at, at this collective, so it's, it's kind of a solution to a problem um, which I think has become evident by the um, 1990s with uh, the real political project um, that is particularly the structural adjustment programs in the global south, um, which have seen rapidly rising inequality, but also the unwinding of existing governance 
institutions, partly because of the smashing of the state that's a, that accompanies them. Uh, and so it, it, it speaks to a real problem that, that the initial formulation of market reforms is, is finds hard to make sense of. Um, this kind of collective property of societies, of people, of networks that allows them to get on with each other, do things well, uh, cooperate for collective gain. Um, so social capital then, uh, I think, emerges um, around both as an outcome of, as I say, this intellectual project, the intellectual project of rational choice theory that um, struggles to explain cooperation in instances where empirically it happens. So you need to be able to say what's going on and where um, there's a kind of first order problem of why people might, if you kind of take a more thought first principles approach like Coleman does. But I think it, it by the time that Putnam's talking about it is starting to also speak to um, a real political challenge. It's a particular kind of political challenge in the global North where he's talking about both in Italy and the United States kind of a sense of alienation from the breakdown of community from much the same kind of policies, I'd argue, which are going on in the global north, but in a diluted form compared to the version that's being um, implemented in much of the global south. Um, but it's a much more pressing problem in the global south. And I think that I'm going to suggest, uh, and maybe provoke, and I'm very happy for people to, to say no, uh, one of the reasons it's taken up much more wholeheartedly in the international institutions which are associated with de the development project in the global south and why I think it's perpetuated there a little bit more. Uh, that process and those two challenges, I think, um, face a, a new impasse that is not entirely about, but I think is catalyzed by and best understood through what happens with the global financial crisis, where um, there's a much more profound challenge to that market, that set of market prescriptions. Um, and there is a very rapid, almost within weeks, about face by international institutions as to what they think are the primary challenges, policy challenges of the global economic system. Um, and inequality becomes absolutely central to those. And so you have the OECD and the IMF um, coming out and talking about inequality is a very central problem about systemic risk that emerges because of inequality, uh, challenges to growth which emerge because of inequality, challenges to legitimacy of states. Um, and, you know, literally you go back six months before that and you read the same institutions uh, and they're arguing for almost the opposite policy prescriptions. Like there's a profound breakpoint that takes place in the way that those organisations understand the nature of, of the problem that they're dealing with, the intellectual tools that they're developing. So that's the first half of the story I want to tell. I'm going to tell another story, and hopefully you're going to see some strong parallels in this concept of social investment. And I want to end by reflecting on what that tells us about the dynamics of both intellectual inquiry um, and political inquiry. And I, I'm going to argue those two things are almost always interlinked, it's hard to separate them, but that doesn't mean that the intellectual inquiry is ideological in the sense that it is, um, that reasonable people can't debate things based on the same evidence and the same concepts. There's still a technical neutrality uh, or an appeal to technical neutrality, which most of the participants in these debates abide by, and that that's part of what becomes the basis of strategy, uh, that the strategies are oriented towards that technical neutrality. Um, but many of the actors clearly are political actors who want to advance particular views uh, and particular outcomes. So um, this is now going to be a story that's much more centred on the global north, but not ex exclu exclusively, which is about that same process. So a process of the reworking of um, social policy logics and a reworking of um, how the state is actually organised. And both of those see the advance of uh, economic rational choice logics, economising of the state and of the theories around it. So we move from theories around the welfare state, which are largely about common risk pooling and social risk, uh, which are understood in terms of social rights. Lots of people quote Marshall and Titmus a lot in order to be able to explain 
how policies develop and how they're organized, uh, where a, a large chunk of the real grunt work of policy, um, uh, both in terms of where policy innovation happens and who rolls out policy is in the line agencies of the welfare state. So it's in departments of education, departments of health, um, departments of social security. And we're going to move to a world where we talk a lot about Nicholas Barr and we talk a bit about John Quiggan. Um, we use what is a, a quite formal neoclassical analysis, but one reworked to understand problems of public goods and of social risk. But it's, it's very much a, you know, a neoclassical economics framework that kind of understands what those things are and a reorganization of the state so that it is the central economic agencies which are located at the center and which don't have usually direct uh, responsibilities for doing things with real people very much at all. So uh, treasuries, departments of finance, um, prime minister and cabinet or central economic advisory agencies that start to uh, drive the way that policy is thought. Um, this is a story that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, but I'm kind of recapping. Uh, and that um, partly out of that comes a, an attempt at resistance from many of the people inside the welfare state to those central line agencies in circumstances where they've been told that they now have to justify things um, in terms of a fiscal, strong fiscal constraint, in terms of um, wanting to promote uh, labour market participation, efficiency and competition um, as overriding goals of policy in every domain. I'm not saying whether that's good or bad, by the way, I'm just saying that's, they're the logics that are being applied and being used. And so increasingly, uh, they innovate by reimagining what they are arguing for through economic concepts and economic language. And one of the, the, the most substantial ways that that happens is around a language of social investment, which some people are now arguing is a new policy paradigm for understanding the welfare state, particularly in Northern Europe, where instead of seeing the expenditure of the welfare state as a cost in a traditional um, way of public sector budgeting and fiscal accounting, where you have tax revenues and you have social spending, and those two things balance each other out. And the political dynamic that, that governs that is one of being able to make clear the tax spending trade-off politically so that uh, parties can go to elections and say, we will give you more healthcare, but we will raise taxes to do that. Um, and that dynamic dominates post-war um, expansion of the welfare state and does lead to an increase in the tax to GDP ratio. It does lead to an increase in social spending as a proportion of GDP across the whole of the global north and in much of the globe, some of the global south as well. Um, and it, it, you know, it has this explicit political logic at its heart, the trade-off logic. Uh, and that is, um, but is usually one that's framed in terms of rights or social needs as the driver of increased spending and increased taxation. Uh, from about the 1980s, that sort of neoliberal turn, I'm going to say one of the central pillars of that is a reassertion of a fiscal constraint. That is, states are not allowed to grow taxation as a proportion of GDP, social spending as a proportion of GDP, that there's a strong constraint, I mean, it's not literal, um, and also on public debt as a proportion of GDP. That all these things are now seen as a problem, generating economic problems. Uh, and so uh, policy is designed to operate within that fiscal constraint. One of the arguments they come up with to be able to, to address that is to reframe much of social spending not as spending, but reimagine it as a form of investment, which has some kind of payoff that justifies the spending in fiscal terms. That's initially almost entirely imaginary. So when it's first happening in the 1980s, um, it's used as a metaphor. Um, it's, I know most familiar with the Australian New Zealand context, it's certainly used there to justify increase in spending in childcare. Uh, it is then used to uh, justify the introduction of income contingent loans in higher education as an imagined investment in human capital. Um, and it is later, so that same logic is then used in the UK uh, under the Blair governments. Um, and then finally is, it is used much, much more literally uh, 
in and is probably idealized in the form of the social impact bonds, where we now have a, a, a very exact fiscal logic that says we'll spend this much money now to avoid these fiscal costs, where we can track the actual fiscal savings from that particular investment that flow through the budget and lead this to be fiscally neutral. Yeah. Now, and that's also associated with opening up um, social policy to private investment. It facilitates direct private capital. Uh, it has a logic of being able to um, uh, have private actors innovate and take on risks that the public sector is seen not to be very good at taking on those risks. Um, but it, 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 it also has this fiscal logic, I'm going to suggest. And that both those things, so I've told the cap, social capital, social investment story, I'm now going to try and draw those together. I hope this is making some sense to you. Uh, and talk about uh, why I think that they both represent um, a shift in the logic of politics, um, which is now increasingly expressed in economic, through economic rationalities. And it redirects um, politics to be able to uh, identify, to uh, measure and to value aspects of the social in frameworks which are designed almost entirely to measure economic outcomes, whether they be fiscal, productivity, GDP. And so you see uh, a logic which I think Marion Waring is probably one of the, the, the best New Zealand and uh, world authors, you know, identifying this logic, um, which happens from both, you might say, from both the people that Fine is criticising, that is where he says this is a logic of imperialism from economics, and we might say from broadly pro-market political actors who are at expanding the reach of economic, rationali economic rationalities and measurement tools in order to control things via markets, to extend property rights and to extend markets, that that is part of what's going on, that this now uh, offers forms of resistance to that, which come by uh, appealing to the very technical neutrality that those tools claim by saying, well, if you're really going to be neutral, you have to acknowledge the uncounted other forms of labour, of value creation and of exchange, which are taking place in this process and incorporate them into the system in some ways. So we need to be able to value unpaid labour. We need to value social connectedness and social trust. We need to have ways to be able to incorporate that into um, the the metrics that are being used to govern this system, uh, in a sense, partly by a price and by prop, not property relations, just in the extension of property, uh, strict property rights, but also in the allocation of rights and risks, we might say, as um, some other authors, uh, Brian Rafferty and, um, uh, and Mike, uh, I've forgotten his last name, um, Dick Bryan, sorry, and Mike Rafferty, rather than the two being together, uh, who have written some stuff on what they call the derivative, derivative logic of financialization, which they take in a much more neutral sense. So not necessarily financialization, meaning things are all bad, but financialization being a way of calculating things in terms of um, net present value, future risks, being able to decompose those risks to their components, being able to evaluate them and price them separately, um, that that's something that is now the way the state thinks, it's the way the individuals think in terms of balancing their liquidity, managing all of, you know, uh, managing household debt, uh, that there is a, a kind of logic to the way that um, states and policies work, as well as the way markets work, which increasingly blur the lines between what is a state actor, what is a market actor, what is a non-state, non-market actor, um, who all, in, and redesigning policy so the, the individual tasks can increasingly be broken down and reallocated between those actors. It's a lot of what marketization has been um, focused on, integration of non-government um, organizations. But, but that, that um, rather than telling that story, which I think that story has been told quite a bit as a, a story as, as of the rise of neoliberalism, 
the demise of the social, the demise of the state, the rise of inequality, and the demise of democracy. So essentially as a critique, and I think most of the stuff written on neoliberalism is, is written as critique. But saying, no, there's actually been a series of sites where uh, things have turned out differently depending on how value was constructed, counted, um, how it was priced, in, 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 in literally in terms of contracting, but um, also in terms of even just identifying what are outcomes which are desirable, which are increasingly priced through um, outcome payments in the, the model of um, social provision, uh, where things like um, having uh, strong community governance, uh, ensuring communities are in charge uh, of being able to roll out programs, that those things create constructing a language that says those things have economic values, then trying to measure what those economic values are is partly a, a strategy clearly to incorporate them into the new logic of governance so that they can be part of that framework of contracting out and marketization in a way that relocates decision-making not from central governments to market actors, but from central governments to local communities. I'm not suggesting that that's what happens most of the time, but it's certainly, there are elements of that happening. Yeah? And I think we can understand the, the one of the reasons it, it can be hard to turn the metaphor into metrics, which I think is true of both social investment and social capital. And then when you do so, often things go a bit fuzzy or go a bit hairy, is because they are the sites of contestation over those things, um, as well as being points of intersection of genuinely different intellectual projects of economic expansion and of the revaluation of the undervalued. Um, and uh, I suppose for me, I'm interested in what are those dynamics? How does that get fought out? And how might we, um, what are the risks of trying to follow the, this logic? What are the risks of trying to count and measure stuff that can then be disciplined by those logics? Um, and what are the advantages of it? What, where, where does it allow you space to do things? Um, so I'm not sure of whether that is that helpful, but that was, that's, I'm now wrapping up and hopefully asking questions, seeing no one has interrupted me the entire time. Uh, to say that I think this is a, a helpful way of thinking about all of these terms and concepts and debates, which are at the intersection of what we might call the social and the economic, um, that represent both a real uh, challenge for the intellectual artifice and project of rational choice theory, but also a potential opportunity for social resistance within what we might call the market rationalities of a neoliberal state. Um, and that that's why they're interesting. That's why they continue. That's why their different forms perpetuate, but also why they're so difficult to resolve. Um, and in a, in a simple metric way that everyone can then just agree, yeah, that's a thing. In the, I mean, it's actually not true that they resolve anywhere else, to be honest. Doing more stuff on accounting, you realise that profit is not something that everyone wholeheartedly agrees on and there's no debates over how it's measured or organised. But certainly there's a lot more agreement um, in those spaces. There's much, much more contestation over concepts like social capital and social investment than there is over these other processes. But um, I think we are partly seeing the frontier of both uh, intellectual work and of um, kind of governance of policy uh, uh, debates as well. Thanks very much. Oh, thanks, Ben. I think that um, quite a lot of people uh, here and who are working on social capital might be um, surprised to hear that they're, they're working with rational choice theory, you know, as the sort of um, conceptual theoretical foundation of, of their work. But I think in the, by far the majority of, of cases that that is the grounding of social capital. Um, but I don't think people are particularly aware of it, perhaps. Yeah, maybe. And maybe I just assumed that. That, that knowledge. So I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to talk a little bit about, I don't know if anyone's read James Coleman, um, who is one of the kind of intellectual forefathers that Putnam takes his stuff from. Um, but certainly that was a, you know, that, that's really explicitly rational choice theory, right? That's a, you know, he writes a whole couple of volumes of what is a rational choice theory of society, re reconstructing sociology on those um, foundations. And 
Social capital is one of the key concepts he comes up with in order to make his framework work, um, to explain why it is that people do things cooperatively when rational choice theory predicts they wouldn't. That's more or less what it is. And, and Ben Fine lays this out, uh, basically talking about how Gary Becker uh, was explicitly dealing with rational choice theory and James Coleman was also doing so, but from a more sociological perspective and how really um, Becker's work was sort of sidelined as being you know, too economic. Um, Coleman's work was sort of embraced as being just sociological enough, but it wasn't really until Putnam almost dispatched um, the whole concept of rational choice theory from his explicit use that the, the concept really took off. But the concept of rational choice, it's not gone in Putnam's work. You know, it still underpins everything. And if anything, Putnam worked to bring in, you know, more game theory and more perhaps network theory into his work than perhaps Coleman even had it in, in his. And so really all of the work that sort of has progressed forward from that point, um, you know, is underpinned by, by rational choice theory uh, and a real lack of, of um, you know, a sociological foundation or action theoretical framework, I think. And, and so most people, I think, in this group and who are working in social capital probably, you know, aren't particularly aware of, of what the, 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 the action theoretical foundation is and certainly wouldn't really be, be aware that it's rational choice theory. Yeah, yeah. And then there's a great question here from, is it Dina? Um, in the chat box. And look, I think it depends which version of social capital we go with as to exactly how it relates to culture. Um, I mean, I think in the in the the very rational choice theory version of it, the the ultra, we're going to recreate social theory from the foundations of methodological individualism alone and build it up, which was uh, a strong intellectual project of um, the kind of nineteen eighties. Um, where a lot of this originates. I think social capital is kind of culture, but culture as a remainder, as the kind of sludge that we can't quite explain, that makes things operate in ways that a strictly rational choice universe, like the world isn't a strictly rational choice universe. To try and explain why it isn't, we kind of have this other thing called culture. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't think that conception theorizes culture particularly well. And I think the conceptions that theorise culture and social capital a bit better than that do differentiate between them. Um, and the culture is a much broader category than social capital, which um, I think is, a, is it certainly is built on cultural foundations for me. I don't know how, how you guys feel, but is a, is a subset of that. Um, Jacob's had his hand up just for a little while. Jacob, did you have a question or comment? Yes, actually, I have three questions, or probably even more. I'm interested, um, I'm, I was very interested in your um, talks that you gave, because um, from time to time when I was talking with researchers about social capital, this new labor thing came up, and uh, yes, that's the thing that new labor did. But um, somehow I also found that um, the, the theoretical um, writings of new labor were not so much or have not or the theoretical impact at least were not so much and i've also not if i look practical it from from looking or from from my uh, gut feelings and from looking back back by uh, back by um, by um i had the feeling that it was just an excuse to cut at the state and say ah we give it to civil society they they will do it they will do it cheaper and um and that there was not much then just we will do something, but not they were not turning it into practice. If you have, I, I wonder if you have a different or um, yeah, partly different um, opinion about that, or if you what do what you think they are also their theoretical contributions were. Uh, second thing is um, how much is done by the Gary Becker fraction to call it today. I, in my view, they were active at the start of the 2000 years, and um, but they but they left the topic by now, at least some point of time. When I'm looking at economics today, I'm I, I feel that we have more about cultural past dependency that's still very active and somehow is related to social capital, but to the 
um, ultra rational choice theory, um, I've not seen so much things, but perhaps I've overlooked something. And um, the third thing is how powerful is the, um, or the third question is how powerful is the frame of um, social investing or building up social capital? Because um, I think now, um, I think now it really became obvious that we have a problem with um, societal stability and um, social coherence and that this needs to build up or uh, if we do some things and uh, let inequality grow a lot, then perhaps we um, do some disinvesting. But I've not, I don't have the feeling that at the, at the more market oriented side of um, the political spectrum, this frame has catched up at all. Um, uh, but perhaps I'm wrong about this, but this was my hope that this, this frame or this um, concept of social investment maybe may, uh, can be a bridge from, for the moderate conservatives to see the value of yeah, investing in the state and investing in society. But I've not seen that it was, is used by so many people. Um, thank you so much. Um, I hope my questions were clear. Thank you, Jacob. That's fantastic. Thank you. It's a great discussion, great questions. Um, so I agree that the, so the new Labour project, we might call it the third way project, right, which um, is particularly in the Anglophone world, but also partly in Europe as well. Uh, I agree that it's, you know, what, what intellectual depth does it give beyond creating cover for liquidating the state and outsourcing it to civil society. Yeah. Um, I think at, at least at that level, it, it's clearly engaging in the same challenge uh, that, that I was presenting, I think. Um, there, there is uh, an element of this being a debate that is framed, particularly the, this initial debate, framed very strongly by um, one left response to the Cold War uh, that's, that needs to distance itself from the bureaucratic and large state and to revalorize civil society and communities as an agent of democracy um, in, a, in that context where, uh, you know, there's a very strong critique of Soviet communism, um, which we've kind of all forgotten now, but certainly is a large chunk of uh, the debates through the 1990s, I think, um, that culminate in the early 2000s in a lot of the, um, I mean, well, the third way is really happening through the, throughout the 90s, yeah, and into the early 2000s. I'm not sure that they, they add lots of intellectual stuff to it, but I think they take up some of the intellectual stuff in the way they frame their response to the political project. So I think a, a large chunk of them being able to say, uh, to explain why it is that civil society is better at doing these jobs, why the state needs to create space for civil society to do it, is coming out of some of these arguments. Um, so, yeah, I don't think it's that the third way is driving the intellectual project so much as it's um, building off it and feeding off it to be able to solve this political problem for the left, I think, particularly. Um, so depending on which bit you're in of the left, so some bits of the left just are actually critical of traditional socialism and are trying to reorganize things and take good bits of um, market capitalism and much bigger bits in a way that was not as common beforehand. Um, but I think there's other bits too, which are, have come to accept a political reality that you can't tax and spend anymore. I mean, that's what Clinton says when he says it's kind of the economy is stupid in Australia, it's, there's a formal commitment from the Labor Party called the Trilogy problem, Promise, which says we will not increase taxes. It's clearly at the heart of what Tony Blair is trying to do in appealing to middle, um, to middle England. So uh, I think that this logic of how can we do more with less, at least, is, is part of that, that, that this is um, responding directly to that fiscal constraint. I, I think in terms of where is rational choice theory. I think rational choice theory as rational choice theory, we don't talk about very much anymore. Like it was a really big thing in the 90s. Yeah, and uh, still a reasonably big thing in the 2000s, I think. Um, but 
So that strategic element of rational choice theory, I agree, it, it is gone. And it partly was, you know, the prisoner's dilemma, which is the game in game theory that is the, the basis of a lot of this theorizing. And is essentially that one of why do people cooperate when they're not when um, their incentive structure doesn't suggest they should. Uh, so I agree it has taken a, a secondary place, but I think the economizing logic of um, that it partly embodied is completely at the heart of how governments understand the world and increasingly how theorists understand the world, increasingly even social theorists who use metaphors and the logics of the financial system as a way of understanding what's going on, or at least think it's really important and try to understand what it is, and the imaginaries of investors and so forth. Um, now, that isn't exactly the same as rational choice theory, but I think it's certainly built on the same intellectual foundations and is, is part of you know, the same constellation of theoretical approaches and is very distinct from some of the other forms of social theory. Um, and the final one on social investment, I mean, there certainly has been moves in the EU to uh, take up social investment. Um, in Northern Europe, there are, there's quite a bit of work in the social policy literature that, that presents it as a paradigm that is emerging and is about to come, you know, in the way that neoliberalism took over from, you might say, Keynesian nation building or welfare, the Keynesian welfare state that explicitly positions social investment as the next iteration of that after neoliberalism. Um, so I think there is at that point, at that end, uh, but in terms of the, the, the sorts of uh, accounting logics of justifying social spending as being productive of something that can be counted and can be captured in some way to notionally fund it in the first place or to you know, the expansion of it, I think that is in lots of the um, socially innovative financing stuff that was around in the last decade. I'm not sure where the, the, the challenge of now, not just the global financial COVID crisis, but COVID, the blowing apart of the fiscal constraint, at least in its old form, like there isn't one, right? That the EU essentially just overturned the fiscal rules that completely crushed Greece, the rule that forced that to happen doesn't exist anymore. They just gave, up, gave it up during COVID because it was about to collapse the entire financial system and make the EU unviable, right? As a financial monetary project. I mean, that's there's crazy things going on in monetary space at the moment. So it's very hard to say exactly what does this all mean. It's clearly an attempt to reassert that same fiscal boundary, right? There's an attempt particularly by conservative governments, but I think a little bit more generally to, to say that COVID is a, a one-off hit and we have to return to some form of normal that means some semblance of balancing budgets, even though that's not possible in the short run. Um, so I think in that context, the, that investment logic will continue in different ways to be quite influential. Um, whether it gets taken up properly or not, yeah, I mean, I think it's also a side of political struggle, so that's a political question. Um, which is, you know, unfolding in the subject of real debate now. I don't know if that helped, Jacob. I hope that yeah, responded yeah, to definitely part. in in some ways. Um, and I um, I found it interesting that you mentioned North Europe um, about social investing because, um, yeah, that that makes sense. Um, some of the programs they do their are structured this way. Um, about your last comment about COVID, um, I think that's, um, that, that was brilliant because I'm um, thinking more or less about um, the same underlying question. Um, when, when we talk about COVID and um, uh, crushing the budget rules and so on, in my view um, or in my feeling, it's happening what you um, mentioned in your last sentence. It's a deviation for one time because there is obviously um, an abnormal situation, and um, the, but most policymakers and most um, lobby organizations or mo most of the establishment in um, quotation marks have in mind. Um, um, then we go back because uh, it, it worked before, it will work after. Now we have a catastrophic situation. Okay, we have to do something. We don't. There's not really. Um, intellectual um, uh, base for what we do now, but it seems the right thing. Like when it's a financial crisis, 
they went back to Keynesian uh, mechanisms without having so much uh, theoretical base too, but something had to be done. Um, and what, um, what I miss a bit or what I was always hoping for is that um, at, the, at the heart of um, fiscal conservatism, and I think that's the ruling um, theory for the last 30, 40 years, is uh, no tax increases or um, uh, and even better tax uh, tax cuts, and uh, that we come to the point where people say, uh, um, okay, we don't want to go back to the bureaucratic state, but um, if you if you can provide theoretical and empirical um, evidence that this and this program or this and this type of program offers value for money, then we are um, willing to spend. Um, money on this, but um, um, I'm based in the green movement and, and in the green movement, we have typical, um, not typical, uh, different types of wings. And um, if I look at the more liberal uh, or economical liberal um, wing, um, I was always hoping that they or, or rather conservative social Democrats were changing the attitudes through this type of social investing. but. Somehow this is not happening, and I'm asking me why is, is it just needing some time, or um, is it um, is there some some else some other cause? Um, I hope this makes sense. I'm just yeah. thinking out loud about what what what's the problem or what what is um, disturbing me a bit. Yeah. So uh, no, it makes perfect sense. So thank you. Um, so I, I suppose I would challenge the idea that it it just hasn't worked. I think it has, bits of it have worked, lots of it hasn't worked, but that's the nature of sites of conflict. So, um, for example, the shift towards some understanding of well-being as a metric rather than economic growth, or of understanding ecological sustainability. Um, I think they are parts of the same broad project of identifying goals uh, and economizing them. That is turning them into metrics, things that can be measured and maximized and then attributed with values so that when you do those cost benefit analyses, essentially of being able to say, look, this, this social project and spending actually pays for itself or has some broad benefit. What, how is that benefit captured or measured? So what is the, the, the way in which you get to say um, well, you know, childcare, um, an investment in childcare has this X return. Um, I think that, you know, I certainly know in, in the, you know, Anglo, Anglo-Saxon world, and I think this is much, it has a different expression in Germany, for example, than it does in America and the US, sorry, in the US and the UK, but um, like it, through Blair, I know it happened in Australia too, the, the, the expansion of childcare was very explicitly based on reports that showed that investments in childcare yielded, you know, $5 worth, you know, for every dollar you got $5 worth of benefit or $10 worth of benefit later on. Um, and that enabled ministers to get things through cabinet that um, breached what would otherwise be a fiscal rule they were supposed to be implementing. And that really did happen. Uh, but Increasingly over time, those treasuries started coming back and going, well, you said we'd spend one dollar and it would save five dollars later, but the budget keeps on going up. Who gets these five dollars you're talking about? How do we capture them in the budget? Um, and it was partly through that logic you start getting things like social impact bonds, where they start trying to tie very directly what those fiscal benefits are. But that's a struggle over what is valued, how is it measured um, and captured which I think is the struggle I'm talking about. And I, I don't necessarily mean to say it's going to win or it's greatly successful, but I, I think it is a, a more contested and less straightforward space than it's just neoliberal co-option. Co that is that everyone's just being, it's a you know, facade for market reforms, which pretends to make them something other than market reforms. It's not just that, um, but it's clearly also not, you know, you can provide good evidence and have good metrics and have good metaphors, in fact, much better than the ones that were initially used for privatisation, and you don't get anywhere near as far. And that reflects the power structure of the state, right, and the interests around it, 
which are far less congenial to that argument. But there's still a struggle. That's all I mean. And I think that's really true. Like if you if you don't engage with the dominant system, then you know, what are you really going to achieve? So, you know, um, teaching in sustainability for 10 years and, and observing the other academics who are also in, in, you know, teaching sustainability and believe very strongly about it. I was the only one who had any desire to connect with economics, you know, as a general sort of principle idea and discipline, because they all wanted to, to fight the good fight. You know, we've got to stand up for the environment and for natural resources and for ecological systems. And without understanding that that's really not going to make much progress when the system is so heavily focused on, you know, the economic rationality, as you've sort of been describing, and that's how we assign value. And so, you know, you need to work within that system. And I think it's the same thing with the social, exactly what you've been saying, that, you know, from the outside, you can look at this and you can say, well, um, you know, if you're social investing, where's the, where's the moral imperative? You know, the moral imperative has disappeared altogether and it has to be, has to make financial sense. It has to be a, a return on investment for it to make sense. Um, but you're missing the point. I think that's missing the point altogether. And the point that you're making, I think, is if I'm hearing you correctly, is that it, it's, it, you know, it does represent value and it is a way to, to make change within the system. Yeah, so I, I do think it is a strategy that can be successful and does help um, organisations and movements be able to show what they're doing also has makes a contribution in, in within the economic rationality and to also shift the economic rationality so increasingly the things that values are not just profits, yeah? So yeah. I think it can do both those things. Um, but I think it, that's a fraught exercise because I think it does open up risks which say, well, like with all things about measurement, once you start trying to measure it, obviously it's a proxy, right? You can't measure the whole of social reality. And whenever you measure the things you don't measure, then start getting cut away, right? So they're not... Um, so that's a, I mean, that's a really difficult trade-off. That's If you want to govern via price, that's what happens when you govern via price or by metrics at all. Like it's not just price signals, but um, any form of metrics. I, I think one of the, the, the that concept of financialization is useful for me at least, is that there is increasingly equivalence between any metric used by the state to regulate and a price. And that those two things increasingly create shadow price systems. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the same thing you see in, in natural capital as well, that the things that are valued are the things that are protected and the other things, which are probably also incredibly important from a, you know, ecological systems point of view, but they're not valued and they're not protected. So the same sort of thing tends to happen. And I'm just responding also, thanks, Marion, for that question. I, I haven't done stuff for the, the Social Policy Whisperer Power to Persuade blog for a little bit. They're still fantastic. They actually do great stuff and they, you should absolutely follow them because these debates are absolutely covered there, just not necessarily by me. But I'm posting there um, another one too, which is a Progress in Political Economy blog, which has similar, it's kind of overlapping. I would say the two speak to each other. Uh, Power to Persuade is a more practical policy oriented version and the PPE is a bit more conceptual, theoretical but they actually overlap in talking to very similar issues and concerns. And Emily's had her hand up just for a little bit. Emily, do you want to ask a question? Hi, Ben. Um, thank you very much. You've really articulated a lot of things that I've been exploring and expanded my thinking. So that's been really enlightening. Um, I'm currently at the start of my PhD. Um, I'm exploring the outdoor adventure sector and social capital within the sector. And I've recently been looking at um, the idea of the sector as a, a neoliberal market economy. So um, I'm going to um, contribute to a paper, um, which is my, the section that I'm gonna write about is the neoliberal endeavor and social capital. Um, and I was wondering, are there any authors or articles or references that speak to this, which you could recommend? As in the the mobilisation of social capital as a neoliberal tool. Yeah, I, I guess about um, I haven't really um, I haven't read up on any of this aspect of. I don't know if you've come across 
Ben Fine's work, but I'd certainly recommend, I think he's kind of the key author that makes this argument and he makes it in yep. quite a number of places in a row. Um, he hasn't written on it for a while, but he, he wrote this, a similar kind of argument and a full book on it um, over about, what, seven or eight years, just night, roughly. Yeah, yeah, at least, yeah. Yeah, from the late 90s through to probably about 2010, I think. Yeah, so his most recent book on social capital was 2010, but he's continued to publish quite actively, not necessarily using the term social capital as much as perhaps he did before. What's he using instead, Tristan? What's, how's he framing it? Um, his, Sorry, I'm putting you right on the spot no, there, no. aren't I? <laughs> his interest has continued to be what he calls ec economics imperialism. Okay, yeah. Um, lovely. Thank you very much for for that. Thanks. Well, good. I have a, another follow up, Ben. I, I feel we didn't perhaps quite uh, leave off the earlier conversation about rational choice theory because I think we've we've seen a lot of uh, a lot of movement within the literature overall towards either just simply not mentioning the theoretical foundations at all, or in fact deliberately trying to bring in some more sort of socially situated foundations. Um, so there's been a big push towards moving back towards Bourdieu's work on social capital, for example, but my own observations and, and also some of the critics have observed that that's done um, by basically omitting his socially situated concept of the individual um, and basically supplanting that with more of a in, uh, methodological individualism in the process. But one particular author that I think has received a lot of traction is, uh, you know, a publication by Nafiat and Goshel, 1998, where they talked about the structural, relational and cognitive dimensions of social capital. And I think very clearly in the cognitive dimension, they're bringing in those sort of aspects of intersubjectivity, you know, the shared understandings and shared narratives and so forth, which don't seem to fit very well with rational choice theory or in fact very well with methodological individualism at all and they seem to be much more closely related to you know the socially situated sort of concept of the individual um, and, that, and that seems to be taking off to some extent but but not explicitly based on any sort of theoretical foundation I mean um, are you, is it the same sort of thing happening in social investing and other sort of related concepts that try to capture you know the the, the value that's inherent in social aspects of social processes yeah i think there is I, and i think probably in the, the those literatures more around polani than bourdieu yeah um but in so in understanding the kind of commodification process of fictitious commodities i don't know if people are aware know much about polani and his work but um he, he talks about the um kind of foundational process of creating market societies or kind of capitalist societies is them turning labor, land and money into commodities. Um, but there being a fundamental tension because those things themselves are reproduced through processes which are not based in market competition. So um, they can't be real commodities because they're not produced for sale in markets, um, but they have to be disciplined by the price mechanism as inputs into the production process in order for uh, market economies to work. Market economies have to have a pricing system for labor for um, land and for money, yeah? And I think uh, particularly some of the stuff around what, what it means to say, what is money? Like, what is the social, what, how do we reproduce? What is it that we're commodifying when we commodify money? And what, how is that produced or reproduced? And I think um, increasingly partly in response to the global financial crisis, um, that is understood as forms of social trust and of collective expectation setting which are inherently socially instituted. Um, and when they're commodified and priced through exchange markets and through financial instruments, um, they, that creates a contradiction between what it is rational to do for each of the individual actors in markets and what is collectively required of the system to maintain social trust and coherence. Um, and th that's why you're seeing a reassertion of the collective role of central banks in being able to do that um, and being able to just assert new forms of social trust through, for example, quantitative easing, which just asserts some new way of money working that didn't exist before, um, but which is accepted because it's underpinned by 
uh, this this form of social organisation and social trust, which is is necessary for the system to operate. So um, it's not quite the same, but I think there is a there's a parallel there. Yeah. So. Um... Nafiat and Goshal and others who have sort of followed the, you know, this embeddedness idea, they typically cite uh, Grenovetter as the, the, the author on embeddedness. Whereas of course, you know, Polanyi was probably the, the origin of the, that thinking and probably was more uh, sort of rounded and sociological, I think, than perhaps Grenovetter was. But it's, I find it curious that, that Polanyi was not, is typically not cited for this. It's interesting, right, because Grenovetter yeah, is developing this concept, which is the key concept from Polanyi, embeddedness, social embeddedness, that's what he talks about. Hmm. Um, and I think you can partly understand what Grenovet is doing as intersecting Polanyi with rational choice theory. Yeah. Like it, that, that's more or less his understanding of what embeddedness is, is an intersection of those two things, um, which I, um, I think partly goes back to that that is the intellectual foundations of the concept, right? It's, right a way of trying to um, draw out of sociology some tools that allow rational choice theory to explain the social, which it just seems demonstrably incapable of being able to do, right? It just, yeah. its tools don't seem to describe reality um, and it needs some extra things to do it. And so it goes and tries to get them from sociology, but it has to reinterpret them um, through the lens of rational choice theory so that they can fit with the rest of the theory. Right. So then like a lot of people would see, you know, uh, social capital as being you know, that integration of economics and social theory. And it seems that the only way it's really be, being, uh, become uh, particularly popular is by effectively denouncing or not denouncing, ignoring the, the economic, you know, rational choice foundations, you know, particularly through Putnam's work. And so, you know, is there, you know, an ontological foundation for social capital that sits between, you know, economics and sociology, or does such a thing just simply not exist? I mean, I'm not sure. I, I must admit, I'm not across the more recent literature, so I, please correct me if, you know. Nothing's really changed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I tend to think that the, the, the potential ontological foundations that are useful are the, these debates about value. Because um, I think it, it's in there that you see a, a real contestation of economics, but in a way that's still designed to integrate with economics, right? So, a, um, which is what social capital is trying to do. Uh, so, I, I think that um, idea of uh, well being, of counting what is not counted, um, is that is the, the foundation that is most logical to me. And I, I think it inherently has a tension in it, which is not, I don't think is a bad thing. It's just, that is that to govern large systems requires forms of rationalization and forms of rationalization corrode forms of social, of social sociability and social institutions. Like that, you know, Weber says this a long, long time ago, right? This is the iron cage kind of problem. Um, but it's, that social capital is partly a way of trying to live in that tension and mediate it. Yeah, that's its, and if you under, I think if you understand that that's its role and its job, and it does it somewhat imperfectly, because it's not, it's not like measuring the height of a river. It's, it's trying to reconcile tensions about the nature of value, which is inherently contested and socially constructed, but which does actually resolve into real metrics all the time. Like that's what the whole world is governed by. Um, and in that sense, that's quite a, it's, it's a useful, helpful thing to do, but it's, it's difficult to try and reduce it into something that says, well, we, we've got the answer for all places and all times now. We go count this thing, put it through this algorithm, and that gives us the result. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, like, if anything, the literature has moved on in recent years to be, to take account of these, you know, socially situated foundations, perhaps, a little more, still not doing so explicitly. And I think the real challenge is that if any conceptualization were to, you know, explicitly state those theoretical foundations, then it wouldn't, it would no longer be appealing within the economic system, within economic, you know, uh, fundamentalism or, or imperialism or rationality, whatever the appropriate word is. Uh, and I think that sort of is the challenge is it's moving that way, I think, to some extent, or at least in some of the literature, but it, it can't, it can't be explicit. 
Yeah, but I think there is you can there is this strategy of taking up economics as a technically neutral science on its word and forcing it to hold to its word, which is that it is supposed to be promoting well-being. It is supposed to account for these different forms of value. Um, and the theory is asymmetric. It doesn't do it properly, right? Like it really doesn't. And to the extent that you can kind of incorporate that stuff in, I think saying that that's what you're trying to do is okay. Like it's hard for them to reject that. Right. Yeah, and I think you've made a good point in some of your previous work that, you know, economics isn't a, you know, a single body of work. It's not a single, you know, uh, concept and ideology that there's, there is mainstream economic theory, but then there's a whole lot of other sort of more progressive and different and sociological type approaches to understanding economic processes that ex still exists within the discipline. And so, you know, when you, Ben Fine sort of does this where he talks about, you know, it's colonization, it's kind of black and white for him, or in certainly that's the way he's presented it in some of his work. But there is, there is an opportunity there to, to sort of bend the economic, you know, the rational choice kind of conceptions, you know, away from that, uh, you know, uh, methodological individualism. And I think that is what social capital perhaps is starting to do. Mm. I mean, I think it's, you even see it in the current debates about Black Lives Matter and Invest Divest programs. You know, this logic that prisons cost lots of money and deliver bad outcomes. If we invested in other ways, we would avoid those costs and that that would be more socially rational. Um, like there is a, but it, it's kind of hard to work out what the ultimate, ultimate metric is. is it, the metric of mainstream economics is profit maximization. So profits are the, the intrinsic logic. There's a, a logic in the state of fiscal, a fiscal logic that's created. So how does the state maximize fiscal outcomes? But I think ultimately there's this kind of attempt to move to well-being as the, the currency of the social, um, which I think underpins all these debates, but is itself like got problems associated with it. But it's, you know, it's pretty interesting as a way of doing things. Yeah, and certainly, you know, in recent decades, there's been a lot of interest around uh, Bhutan's gross national happiness index. And, you know, there's been a lot of desire to replicate similar sorts of things uh, in other parts of the world. Um, and here in New Zealand, you know, we've got the, you know, the well, the well-being um, budget basically. And so there is that same, what you're talking about is, is, you know, very high on the government's list of priorities. And that was a direct response, I understand, I haven't been right in New Zealand, but a direct response to what was a liability, social liability budgeting model, which was implemented previously, which was the thing I was talking about, where you go, and the OECD sees New Zealand as an exemplar of this, going and almost treating every citizen as a liability on your books right, where you might have to pay the money over their life course. And then you try and work out how you minimise that liability by investing in them in various ways that means they're less of a drag on the system later on or they return more through tax payments because they earn higher incomes, right? Um, and uh, typically of a rationalising bureaucracy, the main way the New Zealand uh, government actually tried to minimise the liabilities was getting everyone to have to reapply every three months so they just got knocked off the books, right? So they couldn't get the benefits anymore, uh, <laughs> rather than investing in them so that they were had more capabilities. Um, but that was a model, and well-being is clearly, I think, an iteration that tries to move that in a more positive, progressive direction. But in some ways, accepts the same logic. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, I think that's true. Uh, so there's a comment in the in the chat from Tim about uh, the augmented model of the multi-factor model developed by Chan Ross and uh, Roland Ross. Are you familiar with that one? I'm not, but maybe no. Tim can. Did you want to elaborate, Tim, on that? It's just one of the models used as a whole of economy model in economics. Yep. Um, and by development of a series of proxies within the, for each factor within the multi-factor model, you develop a model that becomes a good descriptor of what you expect to happen or um, what you observe in the economy. So in this context, I was thinking about a, uh, a proxy that describes um, values for social welfare or um, social capital um, that perhaps will help to add some 
uh, explanatory power to that uh, particular model, which I think has a, a fairly good um, predictive um, value. But, you know, there's still a um, chunk of it that's not brought out and most likely relates to these kind of more intangible or time variable factors uh, that are harder to measure and, and um, less prominent as um, being thought of as hard elements of um, economic value. Yeah. I mean, how productivity models uh, like actually measure as opposed to model, like, like how you measure productivity in an era where we're obsessed with it, like in many, uh, particularly service economies of the global north now, no one has really much of an idea to do its practice. And the imperatives of the economy uh, don't always align with it. Like I, I know where, where I'm seeing in Australia, and you are too, like productivity in Australia collapsed as our income rocketed up for the same causal reason. The commodity prices rose. So there was an influx of investment into mining and that investment was into less and less productive sites. That is places that were hard to get minerals out of. The investment was justified by the high price, right? So it made everyone stupidly rich and collapsed productivity. And the, the, the other thing that was collapsing productivity was in our food and beverage sector, there was a substantial shift towards artis artisanal pr production, right? So we had lots of craft beer and these, you know, sourdough bakeries and stuff like that, which also massively collapsed productivity, right? It led to lots more people working, created lots of jobs for people, um, lots more and much healthier out products, lots of sociability in the, yeah, um, but completely collapsed productivity because they don't produce anywhere near as much beer or as much bread as the factories did that used to do it. Um, so that led to this crisis of productivity, which was associated with higher incomes and better social outcomes. And you kind of go, well, what's the point of productivity then? <laughs> this thing we're measuring is not correlated with anything that we care about. Yeah, the importance of a qualitative measure, um, it just seems to become more and more evident over time, I think. I mean, most of those measures really are well designed for a commodity, like a manufacturing commodity based system. Yeah. And if that's 25% of employment and, you know, 40% of output, it's, I, you know, it's, it's hard to say that that's how you understand the entire economy. Or should we invite questions from other people who haven't yet had an opportunity to ask a question? Anybody have anything? Feel free to put something into the chat if you would like, or you can unmute yourself and, and pose a question or a comment. May not have any other questions. It's certainly been a fascinating discussion, Ben. No, Shirley doesn't have any. No, I think that might be it. I think everyone's had an opportunity to ask their questions. It's yeah, it's been fascinating and really great to have you have you on and, and put forward your ideas about this. You know, I think it's a really, really valuable space to be thinking about this sort of big picture, you know, about what where social capital is positioned and and how and why we're using it relative to other terms and concepts that perhaps are are just as suitable or maybe even more suitable. Uh, and you know, how our work might um, might achieve certain ends. Well, thank you very much. I really enjoyed the conversation. I hope it was helpful, but yeah, really appreciate being invited along. So thanks very much. And yeah, check you out soon. Thanks, Tristan. Excellent. So the, the second session will be on in about, you know, 11 hours, 10 and a half hours from now. Um, I'll be giving a presentation talking about social capital um, because it has certainly been framed as a contested concept, but sort of posing the question of whether or not um, posing these conceptual issues as being wicked problems and therefore things that we can potentially resolve rather than just accept um, and how we might go about using a you know, wicked problem kind of framework for understanding them better and having conversations about them and, and trying to move forward with some of these solutions. So um, that'll happen in yeah, 10 and a half hours or so from now. Will that be recorded by any chance for those of us who might still be asleep? Yeah, yes, it, yes, it will be. The challenges um, of uh, a worldwide audience mean some people always are going to be asleep for some of these sessions. 
Uh, and then in two, two and a half weeks from now, in the next session, we don't have a presenter yet for the first session. Um, and in the second one, Will Etty is going to be presenting the results from his PhD. So I'll, I'll put up an announcement about that for everyone who would like to attend. All right. Thanks, everyone. And thanks especially to Ben, um, wherever you are in the world. Have a good afternoon or day or evening. Um, we'll see you next time. Thank you very much.